Hello, party people. It's your boy, Dre. It is the fine. It is the time. I am here with a guest today. Been wanting to talk to him for a long time. Uh, He is the man behind the Quest 64 official account on Twitter that you may have seen all over the place. His name is Mike. Hi, I'm Mike. He's great. (laughs) (laughs) We did establish this. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's super fun to be doing these things so (laughs) i'm glad you said well i'm glad you agreed to this just because i thought it would be a fun experiment because i well you know what before we get there i I, we have to talk about the account okay because i've been following this thing for a while how i don't remember i don't know how long you've been doing this account but i remember when i first saw it i kept sending to my friend vin friend of the show vin he's appeared on here a bunch and I kept sending these to him because I thought they were hilarious, the memes you post on there. I kept saying to him, he's going to run out of material, right? Like, he eventually has to run out of material. And Vin was like, no, he can't run out of material. He can just paste that guy's head on whatever he wants. It's fine. Like, he will never run out of material. So thank you for not running out of material. He, You proved me wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I try to do more than that, but it is a, a super easy way to plow through things. You know, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I I'm obviously I'm oversimplifying, but like, yes, I mean, like you could you could put I basically I love the account because you just turn this kid into a fucking gremlin. It is it is stupendous, I guess. Kind of a basic question to you, like what inspired you to start doing this account anyway? You just thought were you just a fan of the game? You just thought, oh, man, I can just kind of dunk on it while also liking it or something like what what was your inspiration? I started it after Thanksgiving not this last one, but the previous one. So just over a year, I was supposed to be online paying a parking ticket, but the the payment portal was down in my city, so I couldn't pay for it. So then I uh, was scrolling on my phone and I saw that Elon had made blue check marks commercially available like a commodity. I'm like, oh, it'd be super funny to go on there and start a Quest account. And then as soon as I got on, I'm like, why? wait, why am I going to, I'm not going to pay for that. I'll just do it and see <laughs> how long I can do it. And it just kind of snowballed from there. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you just had this random bit of inspiration because it's definitely funny shit. Okay. I have a confession to you before we start talking about quest 64. So we do a thing on fine time quarterly called place your bets where kevin will say to give to me and steve some props will nintendo announce new hardware before x date or something like that and we'll bet on it yes or no like some fake money one of the ones he proposed to me last round was by march of this year will the quest 64 official account get banned from twitter (laughs) and he gave me like 10 to 1 odds and i threw 50 fake dollars at it because i'm like i gotta you know i don't think it's gonna happen but like i don't know you could uh, the wrong person could get a whiff of a goatsy joke or something like that and uh you know report i don't know i i had to throw some money on it so far you are still here i don't know exactly when this episode is gonna air but uh, probably sometime in March when that prop is up. But yeah, I'm glad you are still on Twitter. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, I have slipped a Mario Goatsy into a couple memes because I like using that <laughs> sticker. And I have irritated a few higher profile Twitter people, but I don't I don't think I am I am offensive enough or toxic enough to really get or maybe I just catch people off guard. I don't know what the the gravity of my account is compared to other people's, but it would take a lot, I think, to just get it banned. So. I feel like it would, too. That's why I threw the money at it. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned the Mario Goatsy because he Kevin posted that to me. He's like, see, he's going to get in trouble. And I'm like, no, this isn't going to do it. No, it's tiny. You bear- People didn't even see it. <laughs> yeah, it's a tiny little Goatsy, right? Yeah. It's a little, little cute one. Oh, man. It's, you know, just... out of all the things that I saw on the Internet when I was a teenager, I never thought Goatsy 
would like, I don't know, still be here in the year of our Lord 2024. I just thought, you know, that would be loss of time in the 90s or something. But uh, no, it's got, we're, we're it's still got here. staying power. It's, it's got last. It endures. <laughs> Yeah, it really does. <laughs> for, for, man, for for better or for worse. So when I approached you to do this show, I said I wanted to play Quest 64 first before I had you on, which only seemed right. If I'm going to have a guy on from Quest 64 official, I'm going to play Quest 64 like I just I have to. It's a prerequisite. And all I've ever known about Quest 64 is its reputation, which isn't great, obviously. The only way I'm going to know is by playing it for myself. And you know what? It was a lot more interesting than I thought it was going to be. I honestly thought I was going to come on here and be like, bro, I don't understand. Like, come on, this game. It's look, I'm not going to come on here and say it's great, but it was definitely interesting. But before I get into what I think, I want to hear what you think. Like, obviously, from this account, like, you're a fan of the game to some degree. So, like, when did you first play Quest 64? Like, how did you come across it? Or what's your tell me your Quest 64 story? (laughs) Sure. Um, I can go from 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 inception to the account, I suppose. Uh, Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) So I like everybody else. Um, I had an N64. We got one. My parents were really good about video games. Uh, They played with us, so they coolly got us a Nintendo 64 the Christmas of 96. And games are sparse through even like mid-98, late-98. Through 97, there was only like seven or eight N64 games. So we, we could afford like one game a year. And then everything else was rentals. And Quest was one of those rentals. And I rented it enough times to annoy my mother... (laughs) <laughs> um, and she just bought it, which is, I mean, bless her heart. Cause she didn't buy video games out of the blue very often for fear that it wasn't one that we wanted, but she knew with that one. So then I had it and it, I fell in love. That's, that's kind of great. Yeah, and you're right about 97, 98 being rough for N64. I also had a PS1, which kind of saved my ass at the time. So, I mean, I played a lot of that. But, like, man, if you only had an N64, woo, baby, it, it could be, it could be tough sledding. We did a lot of renting too. I always saw Quest 64 in the magazines and stuff, and I just never, it never really caught my eye. It was just kind of like, eh, looks fine, I guess. And then the reviews came out, and and they were like, it's fine, I guess. You know, and then I just kind of forgot about it. But it became this punchline over time, but we'll get to that a bit later. But, But yeah, so like... So you rented it enough times, surely, like, I forget how this game saves to the cartridge or to a memory card pack. Memory card, yeah. Memory card. Okay, so you didn't have to, like, get some bum, some random save every time you rented it then. <laughs> no. And I went from, so when I got that, so I played it a bunch of times. The, the game before that, I just talked to somebody else about this. I had played Final Fantasy 2 on Super Nintendo. That was the the RPG I played immediately before playing quest 64 because there was some overlap i like other systems you know (laughs) um so to go from like you know cecil and the party being like these pixels that are this you go in the overworld map and they're the size of the city and you know you're the size of the airship and all that stuff and then you turn on quest and you know everything is to scale like it was the first like 3d rpg i played like that and it, it it did something to me that and the music and the bright colors. It wasn't like a doom and gloom, super sad RPG. Like all of that put together was enough to to mess me up for a good 20 years, I guess. And <laughs> I'm carrying the torch now. So. I, I, I understand that, you know, and I think I may have felt like when Quest 64 came out, I was like 16. You know what I mean? If I had been like younger, it probably could have caught me that way. But again, I remember, like I said, when this came out, I wasn't like, oh, this is we're babies or something. I'm going to play Final Fantasy 7. I mean, I did play Final Fantasy 7, which, you know, I think is a fine enough game. Yeah, we all did. But, you know, like, you know, it's it's fine. But like, yeah, Quest 64 just didn't really appeal, especially like you said, cartridges are expensive. You can only get so much. I wasn't really blowing it on Quest 64. I would blow it on Body Harvest for some reason, which I love that game. But like I I love Body Harvest, too. So you're not you're not alone, brother. (laughs) Yeah, I I took a chance on that one. and I loved it because it was like one of the first N64 games ever announced. And I remember just looking at pictures like forever. I was like, I want to play this game. And it looked so rudimentary when it came out, but I, it blew my mind anyway. But um, but yeah, Quest, I kind of passed by 
And then I, like I said, I just kind of forgot about it, but like your account kind of brought it back to my mind. I was like, you know, I want to play this game because the whole impetus for me asking you to do this is because I'm fascinated by games that are considered the worst or just have really bad reputations because I always want to know it, one, if that's fair and two, how we got there. And those are the things I love to explore. And what's better to do that than Quest 64? Something that's a shitty reputation. I've never played it before. And so did you ever feel like defensive about Quest 64 being a punchline? Like, I'm sure back in the day, people were like, oh, man, you're playing a baby game or something. Why don't you play, you know, Shadow Madness or some shit, right? Like, I'm, I'm sure that was a thing. Man, it wasn't like that because we were about the same age. You said you were 16-ish. I was 14 or 15 when the game came out. Okay. It just it just wasn't like that in my friends group. Like and and honestly, I don't remember a lot of like you said the the reviews were pretty average. There was actually some good reviews too. Um and then there was some below average reviews. I mean, that's just the way averages work. But um right. I didn't get a lot of hate and honestly, the none of the hate really happened at all for me until maybe like, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, and that was just I brought it on myself by that point um because <laughs> Because, you know, all of the popular YouTubers and everybody had already run the gamut on the game by that point. And yeah, but like you said, that, that, that I'm interested in the exact same stuff you are. I do a lot of um, writing and these kind of things. I went on the Well Read Mage podcast, which, um, yes, the pixels and he, we, the whole show was pretty much. Uh, how games change perception that's like right in my wheelhouse so i'm super glad to be here for this today fine time fine time fine time so quest 64 it's clearly aged, right? Like, I mean, but it was also never cutting edge in the first place, at least not to me. It always just looked like very Nintendo 64 to me. So that didn't really bother me much today, like graphically or whatever. That's fine. What I wasn't prepared for when I played Quest 64 was how many RPG conventions it simply does not have. It, it there's There's no equipment. There's no money. Yep. There's yep. no shops. There's mm -hmm. like every time you get an item in the game, it's because someone gave it to you. And if you run out, they'll give you another one if you don't have any. That is so fucking bizarre. <laughs> that it's like the, I, that it's like the even... perfect society. There's no money. They You get what you need. Like nobody has too much. <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's so weird, man. Like, I, it's not even good, good, weird or bad, weird. I was just like, what the fuck is this game doing? You know, I was like, OK, are they trying to, like, simplify this for kids? They don't want kids to have to deal, like, buy this thing and learn how to equip it or something. Was that the idea or something? I I just couldn't I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I I guess by the end of the game, I just understood that they wanted to make an RPG light. I mean, it is a role playing game, but maybe sometimes too basic. I don't think any other game works like this. It's it's kind of unique. I always think of it as more like a so like a roguelike. Did you have you played any of like the Sheer and the Wanderer games? I love Sheer and the Wanderer. I'm looking forward to the next one next month here as of this recording. Yes. OK, well, the like so like the N64 one to the the castle building one. And, like it ends up yeah. if, you know, depending on how well you survive, it ends up being the same thing. If you don't have the pot to hold your items over to the next time you're alive, and you're back in town. It's these are these are the items you get. You get what's dropped for you. That's what you have. Like, so that's always the way I approached it was I'm grinding to survive the items I get are the spoils. I don't like, there's no impetus to kill some weaker enemy just because it drops more gold. And then I can run back and buy something later on. And the level ups are all in the magic system and not with the stuff that I put on my body. So it's, yeah, it's, it's so unique. And like, like you said, it, Oh, that was one thing too. So when you get into a battle, I'll talk more about battles in a second. Cause I think that's clearly the best part of the game is that, when when you win a battle, he has that sort of fist pump victory and there's like a fanfare, but mm -hmm. there's no like status screen or anything, right? No. Or results. Correct. 
And then eventually I did just pause the game and then I did get a status screen with a bunch of percentages. Yep. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is this? I hope the manual tells me about this. And I didn't. Obviously, I don't have a manual here. I'm just playing a an emulator. But like, my God, like I hope like was this explained? Like, did you even yes. know how this worked when the yeah. game came out? Does it explain it to you? Yeah, it ends up being like I can't think of another game that does it the same way. Maybe the original Dragon Warrior or I mean, I feel once again, I feel like it was just kind of indicative of the time where if you didn't read the manual for something, it's that's like you're you're skipping out of the game. And if you talk to all the townsfolk, well, if you walk around the monastery and talk to everybody and then you talk to everybody uh, surrounding there and on the way to Dondoran, they do lay out a bunch of it more in game for you. Um, you know, don't forget to check this and don't forget to look at this. And it, yeah. it does. But uh, yeah, if you don't go ahead and read the manual and look at stuff, no, until you go into the pause <laughs> menu, they're not going to tell you that. And it's it's Final Fantasy two based leveling. You know, you do things and that's how you level. So once you figure that out, you're like, oh, look, my, you know, my defense went up because something bought me in the face, you know, and then you're like, <laughs> oh, it's all makes sense now. Look at my now this whole screen is amazing. <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah of course it it does make sense i'm a final fantasy 2 liker by the way i actually do like the way that game works in later versions i probably think the original famicom version is a little too a little too stringent but as far as like i don't know from like donna souls onward i think it's i think it's pretty good yeah um but yeah it's it was just bizarre and i wasn't expecting anything like this from this kind of game which is again it's it's unique I, you got to give it that whether anybody likes the game or not yeah I, you'd have to give it props for that um i think easily the weakest part of quest 64 is like the npc dialogue and just general like talking to people i think was like for me the weakest part it's it just was quickly revealed itself to be like pretty flat and standard i guess there's nothing particularly wrong with it it's not translated terribly or anything like that or it's not annoying or they talk forever or anything yeah but it, it's just clearly one of those games that you play for the battle system and dungeoning i guess would you would you say that's fair it is there was so the game was obviously you played through the whole thing to the end. Yes, yeah? I beat the game. OK, so you notice that the end of the game was a little more sparse than the beginning of the game was like, especially the lead up to the first boss, Silver Ring. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So I became uh, casual friends through another friend or two with uh, James Rathkos, who wrote the quest Prima guide, the quest 64 strategy guide. Wow. He okay. he after he answered uh, a litany of questions for me because I I like that. Um, <laughs> I found out that the game has gone through at least in his estimation. So from the point they got to the Nintendo Treehouse to write the book with one other person, uh, 22 changes, 22 complete revamps of the game from the point they started wow. uh, writing the strategy guide to the end. And every time they had to start playing the game from the beginning again and the saves were not backwards compatible like the game had gone through a serious enough revision that many times that they had to start the strategy guide from scratch and by the end they were very irritated and probably never <laughs> want to see the game again but there was if looking back at you know alpha and beta stuff uh you can only imagine how much uh was just dumped to get the game finished because they were trying to push the game out before ocarina came out so they could uh not get trapped behind that shadow which they did anyway but you know it um but if you are looking for more story elements, I don't know if you if you are made aware of Brian's journey on the Game Boy Color, but there is a 2D remake that does include all the stuff they were trying to include in it as well. So. Interesting. OK, yeah, I knew that Game Boy game existed only because of your account. Honestly, I honestly didn't even remember that happened until you brought it up. And yeah, that is super interesting stuff. Could I ask you this? And maybe, you know, the answer to this there's a number of NPCs in this game that clearly look like they should be party members. Yeah. Right. Was that yeah. surely this was supposed to be a party and not a single person? It was. I've posted screens of that as well. Um, N64 mag, uh, European magazine even had they had a playable build at one point of Holy Magic Century, which is Quest 64. That That's the Konami name for the release of it over there. Um, mm -hmm. And they had three. They had Cozy, who ends up being Kiliak, the pirate on the ship. He was a party member. And then Flora, who ends up being, well, Princess Flora, but she was named uh, Fiona at the time. So at one point, there was three party members. That was all chopped as well. 
Uh, there was another point in the build where Leonardo, the kid with the other pointy shoes and the blonde hair that kind of yeah. looks like Brian, he was also a playable character at some point during development. That was chopped. So, the, I mean, you see, yeah, like you said, there's very standout things in the game. You know what was supposed to be there. It didn't end up that way. It was probably too ambitious for what it was. But, I mean, Imagineer took a swing. <laughs> Nobody else <laughs> yeah. was trying to make RPGs at the time. So, they're like, we're going to try to jam this all on a cart in the shortest mind possible. And that's the amount of time they put into it. And some of it was rough and some of it ended up being pretty awesome. So. That's that's really funny that I was I mean, like, I didn't know that until you just told me just now. And I just somehow figured that, like, no, these people had to have had a bigger purpose in this game. Like, it's so it's so obvious, you know, I guess at this point you just play enough games and you just kind of feel especially old ones where it's like, wait, that was probably supposed to be more. Yeah. But yeah, I'm that's very good information. I'm 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 that's so cool that you got to talk to that guy. That would happen a lot, though. Sometimes you get a guide or see something in a magazine, some sort of walkthrough, and then something they would tell you to do something. It's like, well, that's not in the game. Yep. You know, I it was something I remember this distinctly about the original Resident Evil. I remember me and a friend were following a guide in Game Pro, and they told us to do something involving Barry that was just not in the game at all something you could get or some sort of item and it's like we didn't get that you know and i just remember being like what what happened you know and then i of course and later later in life you realize hey that probably wasn't the final version they had to write a guide on yep he said the same so, thing too i'm sorry not to not to cut it but yeah no, go he ahead, said go they ahead. got to the last point so they got to the last the last right they were at the end of their their contract for that game he wrote some other bigger guides like pokemon yellow and stuff and he's like no we were done so they, if, if anything changed after that point, they straight out told them like, this is the, this is it. Like, so, <laughs> so that I was fully expecting the same thing, you know, mistakes galore and, all, and it ended up being a pretty good guide, especially if you're getting lost and need maps and stuff. The maps are in that Prima guide are essential almost if you, you know, especially if you're 12 and haven't played a lot of rpgs so. oh yeah <laughs> yeah well you know i the, the experience that I, I i i'm sure i would have gotten really turned around if i had played it back in the day now with i have played enough games where i didn't really get lost or i didn't need to look up any maps or anything but like i you know it back in the day i probably would have needed something like that because those dungeons are so fucking long yeah it's insane <laughs> they're yeah. the long they might be the some of the longest dungeons i've ever played in a game they're so i mean what sometimes they take like a, an hour hour and a half yeah like, like baragoon tunnel to get to shelf is almost a half hour just straight running that's you know not including the random encounter rate of this game so which i'm sure you oh <laughs> sometimes i can get really high <laughs> sometimes it doesn't happen often but occasionally it seems like the random encounter thing can spike yeah you know it's 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 weird. It's, it wasn't too big a deal because and this is what I want to talk about next. I thought the battle system in Quest 64 was kind of a lot of fun. It caught me by surprise. It's easily the best part about the game. It's really unique for anyone who doesn't know how it works is that you're you're just walking along and you you do get into a random encounter and it happens right there where you're standing on the field, which at the time didn't really happen. So that that's kind of cool. And then so there's a big hexagon or something like that showing the uh, the play field, if you will. And then there's a smaller hexagon around you showing the, the area in which you can move Brian, your character. And within that space, it is turn based. So you have all the time in the world to line up a spell. And I do mean line up. There is no reticle. There is no anything like that. You you got to, OK, this attack move, this is a line attack or this is an AOE attack or whatever. You got to know that and then position yourself and then use it. If you're facing the wrong way and you just chuck a rock behind it, you know, everyone's head. OK, oops. <laughs> you know, yep. it's it's strange, but I think it works once you get used to how things move and attack. Mike, I think it's actually a really good battle system. I agree. It, that's one of the, the staying points of the game or the things that keep people around is playing through the game, you know, running a different set of elements to try a different set of, you know, spells or something they haven't done before. It's that that's about the main replay, because obviously, like you said, you're not going to find any like side quests or buried story elements. There is nah. a couple hidden things, but um, after a couple playthroughs, you'll find them. 
So yeah, it's just messing around with the battle system. It's cool. Yeah, it's it is a lot of fun, honestly. And I like that you just do the thing where you run to the edge of the thing if you want to escape or something or just, you know, it's it's intuitive and it makes sense. Of course, I realized early on that if I just spam water, if I just upped my water to 50 <laughs> and I and I, I I was thinking of reading a guide on this, like if I could, well, what should I you know, what should I level up? And I was like, no, nah, fuck it. I'll just wing it. I'm, I think I pick correctly because, man, those water spells, I tell you what, <laughs> they're wrecking the game right there. That combined with the um, the earth one, the AOE earth one where the rocks fall. I mean, come on, get yeah. out of here. <laughs> those are generally the two highest regarded trees. Um, water is essential because it's the only healing tree. And mm-hmm. then rock and earth ends up being the most uh, damage, mostly through avalanche, which you were using. But you can play like... If you 50 any of the spells, there's uh, crazy damage spells at the end of all of them. Like any good RPG would have, you know. Yeah. So, But yeah, you you pick correctly for an ease of ease of play for the first time. You did well for. Yeah, I think I, I just looked out on that one. I just I just found at first I didn't really know the water gave you the healing. I just like the water column thing. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's neat. That's pretty damaging. And then all of a sudden I got healing from it. I was like, oh, okay. I think there's some NPC that does mention, like, if you level up water, you'll get healing. I think they did say that yeah. to me. And I was like, oh, shit, maybe I should, you know, that'll <laughs> help. Once you get a healing spell, though, this game becomes a lot easier. It's pretty essential. I'm glad they had the wherewithal to, like, make the camera face the same way it was originally facing before you got into the battle. Because otherwise, I tell you what, going through some of those real long tunnel dungeons, oh, baby. I mean, I've gotten turned around before regardless. I mean, it has happened to me. But, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people miss that little detail, you know, waiting for the camera to snap you back around after a battle, like to put you the way, because it puts you exactly the way you were facing and puts the camera the way you were supposed to be going. But a lot of people get impatient because you're free moving in the battle and they just start running and, so, and then that gets them turned around. And, and then they complain about the game, you know, this game is terrible. All you do is get turned around. Well, you're just slightly impatient, perhaps take one <laughs> more second. Yeah, just just a little bit. Yeah, it'll show you what to do. i have I'm glad I caught on to that early on. Um, why does the cane do so much damage <laughs> when he bops somebody with it? I was surprised. I mean, for a for a single party game where you're a mage, I understand they don't want to like make you like a total white mage kind of type. But like at the same time, that that bop with the cane does a lot. I was surprised. Well, it does. But it's also, you know, because of the way that the game levels you people default to that quickly early on in the game because you don't have you know unlimited mp so people end up finishing a lot of battles by bopping and you know enemies or just going straight at it because they're trying to get through a battle quickly and you don't realize how quickly you level up you know your power with the cane early on you can go through the game without ever using it and then it doesn't it won't do you any good by the time you get to the second boss, it'll be completely worthless if you've never used it. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it is a legit strategy early on to you want to really bop into the king. Because like you said, you don't really have the MP yet. So it just becomes a strategy of like, OK, I got to hopefully I can waste them by just a few more bops or something. Yep. Um, whiffing buffs was kind of weird to me, like attack up <laughs> yeah. or defense up. That was kind of strange. I don't think I've ever played an RPG where you can miss a buff. Well, you're a kid mage, you know, you can't be great at everything. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, man. It was it was strange. I mean, not a huge deal. It doesn't happen super often, but like, man, you know, speaking of bosses, though, you know, the final boss is like a real proper boss. You know what I mean? Like they do a whole thing. I kind of wish more of them were like that. I feel like most of the bosses are just like people. Well, they are. That's the that's the story. So once again, if you didn't get Im- immersed into the story, those are just people that. Um, so the they the story is they open the Altel book. The Altel book is containing Mammon. It's it's you know keeping him in his realm. Uh, it got opened a thousand years ago by King Lavar, and then those stones are inside the book. And those people aren't like evil people. They're they were normal ish 
people with, you know, bad intentions and they stole the stones and the stones corrupted them. So they were, you know, characters corrupted, not some, they weren't like mammon, you know, from the third layer of hell trying to ruin the world. They were just people that got a little ambitious with their power. So, so yeah, there could have been more real, like guilty later on in the game, obviously more demon esque than the other ones are, but you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that was like kind of felt a little more, uh, you know, Devil Kazia or something, you know, yeah. with that uh, that guy. But yeah, I, I just I think I just wish for like a just maybe just like a couple more like at least like a big, you know, uh, you know, when you were going through the volcano there, I was expecting some sort of big Phoenix thing or something like that. I don't know. You know, just maybe a big monster or two would have helped. I yeah, think. it did skip a lot of the like tropes of RPGs where the first boss is, you know, a, a slightly bigger slime or a <laughs> weird animal or something like that. So, yeah, just another thing it didn't do that everything else did. Maybe that's why I like it. I don't know. So. <laughs> it is unique, though. You got, we got to say that. I think the only other point I have to make about the game itself is that I wasn't bad into the music i don't think the music is bad maybe it was like the instrument choices it sounded a little look i know it's in 64 you could only do so much but even by those standards it felt a little snes leftover -y to me maybe it's just my taste i do like the battle theme though that was nice and proper and tense i guess it's probably the best song in the game to me i'm opposite i love the music um okay maybe it just hit me the right way especially uh, deeper in the game, like around uh, Baragoon and Dondarin are are nice, but there's other like the boil hole me or uh, music I really liked, and I'm sure it different music does different things to different people. I don't get you know Final Fantasy tunes stuck in my head, but for some reason I whistle holy planes a lot while i'm walking around during the day so <laughs> yeah it's not again it's not terrible or anything i don't hate it it's just it didn't really you know light me on fire or anything sure that's all but yeah i don't think quest 64 is a great game by any means i it, look if i had received this let's say i had gotten this for christmas 98 okay i would have been totally okay with this i would have been fine i'm like okay you know i get it you know i don't know if i would have gotten the whole way through it without a guide or something but like i would have been totally okay with this but i have a friend I, in fact i know a couple people who did get this at the time and were rather upset with it like so it's 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 interesting. Yeah, I'm, I guaranteed, you know, well, it's just like every other game. They, they hit people differently. I know people didn't love it because I've heard that. You know, I, that's one of the blessings of the account is people have told me they love it. People have told me they hated it. You know, I get to hear both sides of the story. I lived my own, you know, journey. I lived my own quest with the game. and um, But it's not like I don't respect other people and the way they played it. I'm not trying to, like make people love the game that's not my goal it's just you know it's hearing people talk about it is just as good as hearing people just outright praise it just because they want to get the attention of the account you know? <laughs> yeah I, I hear you well it, quest 64 it was interesting i can say that much i'll take it bye, bye, bye. One thing I always hear from people who didn't like the game is that it, like, you know, because it was like the Nintendo 64 is like first proper RPG, whatever proper means in this instance. Right. Yeah. And I, there was a, there was a certain expectation of it that was not met for those people, whatever they were expecting. But my question or rather my counter to that always is look at it. Like, <laughs> look at these, like, at any point during Quest 64's, like, you know, ramp up to uh, release, did you ever think this was going to be, like, Final Fantasy VII or, like, some other type of RPG? I think I feel like a lot of people who are disappointed with it expected something out of Quest 64 and the Nintendo 64 system, for that matter, that was never going to happen, you yeah. know? And I feel like that's the genesis of the bad reputation to me. What do you think? No, I agree. Um... Anybody who had the system early on, obviously you did, I did, figured out 
pretty quickly, even after, you know, having Mario, we, a lot of people had Mario right away, but if your second game wasn't a multiplayer game and you didn't realize that the system had four control ports on the front and that the best games on the system were meant to be played with friends and family, like it wasn't shooting to be, you know, a single player time killer, you know, it was meant to enjoy with your friends. I played I had a PS1 not till a little later, um, but I played exclusively single player games on the PS1. Especially, I played a lot of Gran Turismo, and I had no intention of playing that multiplayer. And I, if I wanted to play multiplayer, it was going right back to N64. And if obviously I can't affect how people feel about things, but if you didn't figure that out pretty quickly, you know, GoldenEye, WCW vs. Uh, NWO World Tour. Um, all the other Wayne Gretzky's hockey was out early. I mean, those were the games. <laughs> yeah, I, I I totally agree. And you know, I, it's funny. It sounds so simple when you, you put it that way, but it is true. I mean, it had four controller ports for a reason. We did Mario Kart sixty four. We did Star Fox sixty four multiplayer. All that kind of stuff. We were never Golden Eye people, but like, yeah, there was plenty of Mario Party. You know, like uh, that was a machine for that. The only things I did multiplayer on ps1 were fighting games i had a friend i mean we'd play rival schools or street fighter alpha 2 or whatever right like we play all those on on playstation because really i mean who had a saturn really so like you know we uh we played them all on there or at the arcade of course but um but yeah that's kind of what it was for and i always try my best to take a game for what it is instead of what it's not and i i've always had that approach with games so i just think it's not fair to Quest 64 to say it's not this or it's not that. I feel like you just kind of have to take it for what it is and not what other people posit it to be or what you wanted it to be. The game is what it is. So I just think it's unfair to be like, well, it's not Legend of Dragoon or some shit. I mean, of course not. <laughs> I yeah. Mean, I don't even like Legend of Dragoon. I don't even know why I pulled out that that example. Yeah, but people <laughs> do. So that's a good example. <laughs> I did, people really do, though. One of the things I wanted to do here is talk about because Quest 64 is obviously it's like we said earlier, one of those games where, you know, it has a reputation. And I just wanted to talk to you about maybe two or three games. I asked you to think of a few that have bad reputations that are undeserved. Like we said before, it's one of our favorite topics between us. So maybe you can tell me one of yours now. What do you think is a game that is just unfairly recognized okay so i actually this i probably spoiled this on twitter so if you do follow the thing um but while (laughs) i was excited about this show a couple weeks ago when we talked about it i had i got really ramped up about one game in particular uh kobe bryant's nba courtside so Hmm. i know that sports games are just not the thing you know as far as lasting power in the retro community they're considered you know subprime they're not yeah. collectible but so this game came out in 98 and ended up being the 38th best-selling n64 game so it sold a million one two something like that it outsold like pilot wing 64 it outsold f-zero bomberman 64 all those games and it came from left field productions uh who only had one game uh another uh, another sports game i think it's slam and jam um on assorted systems 3do and stuff but they made this whole new ip for the n64 and they knocked it out of the park like that game got like game informer gave it like a nine and ign gave it like a 7.8 same with nintendo power egm was like and it was it was amazing everybody loved it and it had kobe bryant who was not a star at the time he was maybe 18 19 rising yeah rising star yeah and they had the the foresight to put to put a young player on it that would catch on as well which also helps out but i mean this really what i'm talking about could be any sports game to be perfectly honest i mean it could be nhl 94 it could be nfl blitz it could be any one of those games that was considered a classic and then had staying power where people still collect it and people still appreciate it but it went the other way you know (laughs) since then now what do you think about when you think about like n64 sports games most people are like oh you know two dollar piece of trash that's a filler title you know (laughs) quarterback club 99 or some shit yeah yeah would you make like you know coasters out of it and stuff like this game was great it still is great 
and it was a, an exclusive to the system and yeah. everything that you would want out of a video game. And instead, the retro community just threw it in the trash. And I, and especially coming from a, a company that makes such quality games, you know, because Left Field eventually made uh, Excite Bike, I believe they went down and made. Yeah, Excite Bike 64. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, it's not like they made continually made bad games after this one. It, but I just don't. Um, Maybe I have a soft spot for sports games, but this was one that really like hurt me personally because of my love for the system. So, it's <laughs> yeah, you know that is a strange one. It is a game I forget about. I've never played it before. Um, the 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 basketball games I was into was like NBA Hang Time or NBA yeah. Showtime or something yep. on arcade or Dreamcast or whatever, right? Like I was kind of playing those. I never did play this NBA courtside game. Like I said, I do remember it existing. And I remember getting good reviews. I remember it being fairly popular. I remember going to a couple houses that had it or something. I just never played it. So it just it's just one of those games I just completely forget about because I've just never laid eyes on it. But yeah, it's funny that it had that it hasn't had a resurgence because like some sports games can occasionally have that panache. Like I think maybe like the NES version of baseball stars or like, you know, mm-hmm. like the, some, some, some games can, right. But well, like you said, hang time and showtime, obviously being the spiritual successors to jam, people still love those games because they loved NBA jam. So, you know, you like the next game and this one didn't have a pedigree. It didn't have, you know, and then it died when the N64 died, there was courtside one and two and that was it. Like they were good. They were, they were good. So I think that if you weren't a product of that moment or, you know, of that system, even if you had a PlayStation or a Saturn or something instead, you never touched it. So it didn't mean anything to any of those people. So. Right. A system exclusive. And if you had, like you said, if you had a PlayStation, probably playing NBA Live 97 yep. or something like that. Or, yeah. So it just wasn't. Yeah. But you're right about the having the wherewithal to put Kobe Bryant on the cover was kind of like you said, he wasn't a huge star yet. I mean, look, I grew up in San Diego. So like in the Southern California, I mean, obviously, like the Lakers were still popular there, too, because we yeah. had to have a basketball team. So like, you know, I, I knew who Kobe Bryant was, but maybe not you know the nation at large so yeah it's um that's a good one so i want to bring up one that drives me insane when people dunk on it and it is the snes the second i should say snes castlevania game dracula x are you familiar with dracula x or i am okay for those who don't know Dracula X on SNES is a remake of sorts of Rondo of Blood. A game came out a couple years prior. I think Rondo of Blood came out in 93. Dracula X on SNES came out in 95. And Rondo of Blood came out on PC Engine CD, aka TurboGrafx CD, only in Japan. Never came out here. And even if it did come out here, it would have been on fucking TurboGrafx CD. So yeah. like nobody, nobody, nobody would have played, played it. it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it didn't come out here. And I remember distinctly when the SNES version of Dracula X came out in 95, it was largely dismissed as an inferior version of Rondo of Blood. Here's the problem with that. Like I said, Rondo of Blood did not come out here. It, we did not get a version of Rondo of Blood until 2007. I think that PSP version. Right. That's the first time it has ever come to North America. So why would anyone say how would anyone know that? Yeah. Right. Like maybe magazines would have known that because they reviewed import copies of stuff and you saw coverage of stuff that may or may not come here. And they did that kind of thing. But if you weren't and if you weren't the type to actually import those kind of systems, I think you're just parroting something that you read in a magazine about Round of Blood and you didn't play it. Absolutely are, <laughs> you know, like and, and that that shit drives me crazy. But people will still do it to this present day. And I'm not out here saying like Dracula X is the best or something. At SNES. like I do like the game. Don't get me wrong. It does have its flaws, but it, it drives me insane, Mike, when people will just say something because they heard other people say it. That's the YouTube problem that and the, and I'm bringing up this example because this example goes all the way back to the magazine era. People have been doing this forever. Well, two things to you, I guess. What do you think of Dracula X? And have you noticed this phenomenon about it? So I have not extensively played dracula x i played super castlevania 4 instead um but for the same reasons um i wasn't huge in the ends in the super nintendo i had games 
but it just that wasn't one of them. But like you said, it didn't have a bunch of fanfare leading up to it either. And I didn't have a turbo graphics. I didn't <laughs> I wasn't like I wasn't like pining for Rondo of Blood to come out. Like I liked Castlevania games up till that point, but I wasn't like just sweating waiting for this thing to come out. So I mean but I have, just like you said, seen people talk about it and when you you know when you prod and you poke people about why they dislike games because it happens with quest 64 as well about 80 percent of the time it instantly falls apart it's like well i mean i didn't play it that much but and then they say something like you said like i saw matt pat say that it had a really bad frame rate and you know and, and then they just go into this big long rant and i used to do that all the time with people when people are like Hey, there's a new quest video out. Why don't you go watch it? I could write a bingo board ahead of time <laughs> of the things that people were going to say about quest that yeah. have been repeated in every other YouTube video and every magazine. And I could fill it out and sit there and, you know, zoom with them and be like, and cross <laughs> the things off while the video was playing. I'm like, you, you think that like, I haven't heard these exact phrases before. Like mm-hmm. it, there's a reason popular YouTubers are popular is because they're captivating. And when they say, you know, captivating things or quotable things that carries on even if you haven't played games. And it's a it's a straight up disease. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you 100 percent. I couldn't agree with you more. Like I just again, I know this is going to make me sound like some sort of Dracula X fanboy, of which I am not. It's good. I'm not a huge fan of Cat Super Castlevania four. Actually, I like it just fine. I would probably say they like Dracula X more. It Yeah, it cribs a lot from Rondo of Blood. But again, Y'all wouldn't know that unless you played it at the time and you didn't. So yeah, what you was know. your point of comparison? Like what what do you like what do you like Dracula X more or less than? Like, <laughs> like. <laughs> Exactly. Again, magazines could say that, but that's where they got their opinion from magazines. Mm-hmm. So um but yeah, that's the one that has always driven me crazy. So I I stick up for Dracula X a lot. But yeah, why don't you tell me, I have one more, but why don't you tell me um, another game that you think has a really unfair reputation nowadays? Well, I want to keep the ball rolling where we're at right now and go straight to Castlevania 64, which is another one I have a huge problem with. Um, Wow. Because for the same reasons um, as all these other games we're going to be talking about, but specifically because it was the first 3D Castlevania game. So same thing, 98. There wasn't a lot of games. This was a pretty early release for the system. Uh, but IGN called it the top third person game on the system. And it got like a 9 out of 10 from GamePro. It got 8.75 from EGM, 8.2 from IGN. Everybody was saying it was amazing. It had that day and night cycle where the monsters changed and the whole game changed. And yeah, it had problems. You're a Castlevania fan. Obviously, we've now established this. Um, yep. It had platforming problems. It had camera problems. But everybody ignored that when it came out. And it was, like, off the charts. Everybody loved it and was okay with the fl- with the faults. You know, fast forward to now, or even 10 years ago, YouTubers like, like, I'm, I'll name names, even if you don't want to. No, go ahead. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but, like, Matt McMuscles and RGT85, those guys made very popular videos, you know, saying that it was a huge mess and it was the both of them quoted worst game in the series, worst game in the Castlevania series. Like how many Castlevania games have you played to come to that conclusion? Did you play the entire catalog? Like, did you play the whole library? Like, did you play Castlevania adventure on game boy? Like, did you love that? <laughs> Was that just like top of the heap for you? I mean, <laughs> I have, I have taste and feelings too, but I know subjective versus objective and uh-huh. Castlevania 64 was pretty fucking sweet, <laughs> like, even if it wasn't finished, because obviously Legacy of Darkness came out not even a year later and they say they finished it and they added all the other stuff. And that's the superior version and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, when you go like to comic book sites like CBR and they say the same thing, they have a whole article that that it's Castlevania 64 is widely considered the weakest of all the Castlevania games. When did that happen? When did you when did you all make that distinction that? it's okay to say things that are, are your least favorite, but when you start like ranking things or putting things in lists and saying, this is the worst, that's a completely different story than, than saying that you didn't enjoy something, which is another huge problem I have with YouTubers. They can't just say this game was okay. Or this game was, you know, not my favorite. It's always the best game. 
or the worst game I've ever played in my life. And then they have an angry face next to their, their, their link. And man, this, this, this culture that we've got ourselves wrapped into like on the internet now is so crazy to me. Like <laughs> it's, it's wild, man. It really is wild. It, the, the, the group think is strong. I just yeah. can't, you know, like, and, and, um, so I'm going to say something. I yep. am a Castlevania head. I have never played Castlevania 64 or legacy of darkness. Okay. So those are blind spots for me. Never played them. Always wanted to hope they hit like, Nintendo Switch Online sometime or something if Konami feels generous or something, right? Or maybe <laughs> yeah. I'll just, you know, since I got all the emulation set up for doing Quest 64, maybe I'll play Castlevania 64 now, right? Who knows? But so I can't really speak to the game itself because I don't have any personal experience with it. However, I have absolutely noticed a phenomenon you said. I do remember the good reviews at the time. I remember the... I think you said the game pro one gave it like a nine or something like yeah. that. And I do remember being like, really like people are going to, you know, cause of course everyone's skeptical, like Castlevania and 3d, how is this going to work? You know? And apparently it did for a lot of people. So I don't know, man, it's, it's interesting. And it has had that reputation now of being the worst. And that's all I hear about it, you know? And I don't, I never hear anyone say anything good about it. So yeah. I, I really want to find out for myself. You should. If you typed into Google right now, Castlevania 64, so I was just, while we were talking, I just quick, because I love the way Google works. It's uh -huh. just it's just such a treasure for the gaming community and all the information it provides you, especially the the most terrible, uninsightful things ever. But right at the top, <laughs> there's an article from The Gamer, which, if you know anything about that website, uh, you're not getting quality <laughs> information from them anyway. But it's nope. literally, <laughs> it is, the, the headline from their article is, Castlevania 64, it's one of the worst games on the console. That's the that's Come their thing. <laughs> come on. There are so many crappy N64 games. Like, come on. There's just again, I've never played it, but that just cannot be true. It's it not can't true. be. As some somebody who <laughs> has played, I have a full physical library and have played every game at least for an hour or two. I mean, it's not even close. Like it's it's a really good game it's on the op so it, it that reeks of of 20 year old clickbait writers trying to get you know attention to their website so that's <laughs> yeah i just like it's come on please like i just it's it's a why and look i'm a person who has some unusual castlevania opinion steve on this show always ribs me because i love castlevania the adventure i do i love that game a lot of people don't it gets slow or boring or whatever. I love yeah. Castlevania Adventure. I don't give a fuck. But Simon, like, do you like you Simon's know. Quest too? Um, kind of. You know, I have a love hate relationship. I, there's aspects of it I love, aspects of it I don't love. So it comes out to being like good, I guess. I'm trying to like build your Castlevania list here while we're at it. Like, <laughs> yeah. What about like, did you like Mirror of Fate? I did not like Mirror of Fate. Okay, so, right, so there, well, at least we can put that one below. You can go into <laughs> Castlevania 64 knowing that it's better than Mirror of Fate then. At least from a friend. A trusted friend now. So. <laughs> okay. We recently played Castlevania Legends because they recently put on Nintendo Switch Online and neither mm -hmm. of us liked that at all. And I like the other two Ca Ga Castlevania Game Boy games. That third one, no thanks. So that's probably down there for me too. Perfect. Um, boy, I love the Castlevania talk today. <laughs> Okay, one more I wanted to talk about, because I already mentioned Mega Man and Base, but there is a game I want to talk about, and it was a launch game for Dreamcast, and it's called Blue Stinger. Yeah. You ever played Blue Stinger? I, or, have, uh, I was also a Dreamcast head, so. I okay, think. yeah, I was from day one, from nine nine ninety nine. I fucking love this system. I didn't get Blue Stinger when it came out, because, like, you know, I was getting, if I was spending 50 bucks on stuff, it was like, you know, King of Fighters or Sonic Adventure or whatever. It wasn't quite, so I got Blue Stinger later when everyone turned it in and hated it to GameStop or whatever. Yeah. And I remember going to a GameStop and I want to say like spring 2000 or whatever. The Dreamcast had been out for months. The fucking clerk tried to talk me out of buying Blue Stinger. Seriously, I was like, you got to, you know, like, and he's like, are you sure you want this game? Yes, I'm sure I want this game. Uh, are you really sure? Yes. 
Then he proceeds to open his case behind him and show me that he has like seven or eight blue stingers here. And it's like, everyone's turning this game back in. You're really sure you want one? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I was and I fucking felt like saying, yes, I want blue stinger. God damn it. I know what the fuck I want. So just sell it to me already. Yeah, well, drop the price then if you've got seven copies and give me one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take the whole lot of them for seven ninety nine or whatever they were selling them for each. And uh, I, of course, I was polite about it, but I was pissed. Like, I'm sorry, every jack off who comes into your store doesn't know what they want, but I do. So leave me alone, please. And then, of course, you know, the funny thing is, I'm sure you remember that. um a lot of launch Dreamcast games had some bad print runs like they didn't yeah. work. Yes, yeah, I, I got a blue stinger that didn't work. So I had to go back there the next day and look at him again. And he had to give me another blue stinger and it was annoying anyway. But um, I finally played blue stinger and man, it's a goofy ass little game, huh? It's kind of fun. I enjoyed it. The voice acting is so atrocious. It's funny, like funnier than the funniest Resident Evil back in the day the plot is as ham-fisted as it gets but like in 1999 we were kind of used to that from these types of like action adventure games so it wasn't really out of line compared to like other stuff we were playing are we gonna say like blue stinger was any worse acted than like dino crisis or something i don't think so and you liked body harvest so you knew what you're like i mean oh, yeah. the idea of some like <laughs> crazy nonsensical plot with with aliens and stuff and and like it didn't matter like you played no. those games for this <laughs> it, exactly yeah I, I was totally for it and I, I think this is again with expectations i think they were trying to sell this game as a survival horror game and it is totally not a survival horror game i in my opinion like this uh, there's nothing survival horror about it it's not scary there's no horror elements to it and there's hardly any survival elements outside of the fact that you m might have limited ammo. That's about it. And then you can buy more from vending machines, if I remember correctly, yep. as well as like health items. Not very survival horror to me. I remember arguing about this with someone on a podcast I used to be on. And his quote unquote evidence to me was that he went to Wikipedia and the, and the description said it's survival horror. Well, here's my evidence, bro. I played the game and it's not survival horror. I don't know what else to tell you. Like, I, you know, I, I do believe that's what maybe the developers intended to do when they were trying to make Blue Stinger, but they didn't make it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I guess I guess my point of saying all this is, is that like sometimes we just let stuff become gospel without applying any critical thought to it. Yeah. You know, or better yet, just actually playing the game and everyone will go, hey, Blue Stinger isn't really a survival horror game. OK, that's it. Like, I don't know. Well, I'm glad you've played this game. So, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. I don't sound completely insane. <laughs> no, you're right. So two things coming off of that. Uh, one, I played before I played Blue Stinger, I played Dynamite Cop. And that mm. game is a lot closer to Blue Stinger than Blue Stinger is to, you know, resident evil nemesis or something like that like <laughs> yeah. it's a both aesthetically and you know the speed of the game and the things that are going on are much more you know dynamite cop action adventure with that third person sort of survival horror tank controly sort of thing you know you could like you said you could tell they were maybe going for something different than a than a action beat -em up thing but it yeah. didn't come out that way and then two, uh, people labeling games is the bane of my existence. Like trying to decide <laughs> if I could tell you how many times a day people are like, well, there's only two RPGs on the N64. That's why nobody oh plays, you know, something. Like, and I have to <laughs> sit on my phone outside while I'm delivering mail and prattle off the like 18 RPGs off the top of my head that you and, and you've only played two of them and I get it. You just are saying things <laughs> to say things. And then you tell them, you know, Gone the Legends in an RPG, bro. And they're like, that's a hack and slash. I'm like, I did you did you name your character? Did you level up your character? Is there choices on how you leveled it up? Is there a narrative? And, you know, I feel like maybe we're playing a different game here. But, you know, <laughs> As long as they don't tell me Ocarina is an RPG, then I, I'm we don't have to fight. I don't have to like drop my hands at that point. <laughs> I hear you 100 percent for sure. It drives me insane, too. Yeah, I, I like Blue Stinger a lot for what it was. Again, I just um, like I said, I had a goofy B movie charm to it. 
it was fun enough. It had like a big epic ending where you, you know, with explosions and shit. It was, it was, and the, like I said, the voice acting, hilarious, just, just incredible stuff. Really funny stuff. Terrible licks, lip syncing too, which makes it even funnier. Um, but yeah, it just drives me insane when people are like, well, it's no code Veronica or something like that. And it's like, bro, I want to, I'm going to hurt you. I just, I, I need to step away now. I wish I would have known you were a Dreamcast fan. I would have came all Dreamcast for this. Maybe we should do a separate episode of that because like, I will, this whole thing that we're doing, I will do this all with, you know, Alien Front Online and Toy Commander and oh, uh, uh, like, um, <laughs> frick, you know, Power Stone 2 and. Oh, yeah. I, You're speaking my all, language now. All You're these talking games, dirty to me. people, <laughs> yeah, all these <laughs> games are games that people are like, oh, that was really good for like 30 seconds. And then I was over it. You were over playing an online tank game like in, <laughs> in, 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 in 99 <laughs> with voice controls and like, like, get off this. Like, <laughs> yeah, bull, bullshit. You were not over that shit at yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dreamcast, Dreamcast was too wheelhouse stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I love and, and it's still to this day might be my favorite system of all time. I was such an arcade head growing up, so like as an arcade player, the Dreamcast was just heaven. You know, I just had every single fucking thing plus everything else. You know, you had your it, it, just a great library in that short span that it lived. It gave me everything that I wanted. Um, if you got if you got another one here, I think I'm I think I'm out of examples. If you got another game you want to talk about, lay it on me. I'd love to well, hear it. Though I did I I didn't want to do too many, but I did prep Quest just in case you wanted to make if you wanted to go longer on how Quest is perceived. You know, if you want to go deeper into that, I didn't bring a third game other than Quest. So if you want to do Quest for another five minutes, we can do it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, tell tell me, say anything more. You, I want the Quest sixty four man to tell me anything else he has to say about Quest sixty four, the definitive record. <laughs> well, like you said, it wasn't. It didn't blow people's socks off when it came out, but some outlets were really high on it. Uh, so official Nintendo magazine, um, which is the European Nintendo power at the time before they rebranded that they, they were 8.4 and just gushed. I just posted a screenshot of their like one page article on it the other day. There was a lot of hype on it. And some people who got it, you know, Europe had a different library than North America did. The PAL N64 library was different. They loved it. And, um, I, I don't, once again, I don't know how we get from things like taking the negative stigma of a few, of a combination of keywords in a Google search and changing it from, this game was fine, it was, it laid the groundwork for RPGs on the N64, we got some good ones, you know, we got Ogre Battle, we got Paper Mario, we got, um, well, we talked about Sheer and Sheer and the Wanderer 2, Super Robot Wars, um, some people don't like Aiden Chronicles, but it exists. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, there was a lot of good RPGs on the system, both the custom robo games, which I don't care if you consider it an RPG or not. It is because Pokemon's an RPG. So custom robo is an RPG. <laughs> and that's is, that, once again, not debating those again. But the like take Quest 64 seems like it went from being just a game, just a game that you either loved or you overlooked. And it turned into like a focal point for people to hate the Nintendo 64. And I know that Superman 64 gets a lot of flack and game and they, people say things like there's no fighting games on the system because there wasn't street fighter and you know, there wasn't Tekken, but there's good fighters as well. We don't have to do that. But, but right. as far as labeling games, RPGs, and then making a game, the villain, I don't understand where people's like what the prerogative is for that. Other than to like tribalize how much you like one system over another quest 64 was was really decent. Mm -hmm. I don't even I even the Quest 64 guy I never go out of my way to say it's the best game on the system because it's not. I can probably name 30 games off the top of my head that I like more as better games. Like if I'm, I'm going to put quotes around all this stuff, it's my favorite game, but it's not the best game on the system. Yeah, There's Body Harvest games. is my favorite game, but it, I yeah. know it's not the best Nintendo 64 game. I would never yeah. say that. Yeah. Yeah, there's different and I that distinction that you have the you know the wherewithal to say that instantly makes me respect your opinion. And the quickest way for me to not respect somebody's opinion is to say it's the worst game on the system, and here's why. And then it you know they don't say anything. So uh, yeah, but like it's not like the game was janky. 
So people don't like Aiden Chronicles, but they still think it's better. If you've played Aiden Chronicles on the N64, it's, you know, bug ridden and it suffered from an even more flawed development process. And but people don't, you know, villainize that game. It's they don't like it, but it's just oh, it's just a, that's just not a good game. You know, it's not the worst. <laughs> it's definitely weird. Yeah, I never felt like Quest sixty four was jank at any point. I feel like the only thing it made like it, like I said, figuring out how to line yourself up for attacks, but it wasn't jank. It was just like something you had to get used to for a few battles, and then you get used to it. But I wouldn't say that was like janky at any point. There's definitely N sixty four jank. I don't think Quest sixty four is one of them. Yeah, it, it avoids that trope of having a bad camera and bad platforming because you don't have to jump ever. Like there, there's no necessity to to puzzle solve or you know do any crazy trivia or you know, you know mem- memory games and stuff like that. Um, there's nothing like that. Yeah. So the dichotomy for me is saying things that, like we said, are extremely good or extremely bad sells YouTube videos. That's what it does. But that didn't happen when we were teens, like no, like extremely high and extremely low magazine scores didn't sell magazine subscriptions. People weren't looking for like clickbait covers of game pro or EGM or something like that. It was about just seeing pictures and enjoying, you know, getting a perspective. And I don't know when we lost that And the quest. So all the things that I love and hate about the internet, I've kind of like, compartmentalized into quest 64 now and that's <laughs> kind of been the bigger mission it's i like i love quest and i wanted to come back and i wanted our generation to play it so we can erase all of this stuff all this you know miasma that's happened over the last 10 12 15 years about the game because it like you anybody who plays it you don't have to love it but they're like oh this this definitely is not the worst RPG of all time. This is definitely not the worst game on the system. I don't understand where all of this is coming from. You know, it's that the bigger goal is to get rid of all of this through objective personal playthroughs of video games. So, by God, if we could just play games like <laughs> yes, just play the games. That is that is exactly it, man. Play the game for yourself, guys. If you heard a game is bad, but you're like interested in it or whatever, just try it. You never really know until you try it. And what you were saying about it coming back for so new generation could try it, that's what Capcom missed out on with the legacy collections because they had a collection for Mega Man 1 through 6 and then 7 through 10. They left out Mega Man and base. And that's further led delegitimized it to people it's like oh it's not a real Mega Man game that's something people say too it's because it reuses a Meg- the graphics yeah. from Mega Man 8 oh it's somehow like it's just a side game I don't know bro you got 8 robots you got 8 levels you got a uh, it's not Wily but here's a castle afterwards it looks like a Mega Man game to me I don't know I'm not sure what else you want here the Mega Man 8 uh, reusage accusation is hilarious because, oh, my God, Mega Man reused assets. Holy <laughs> yeah. shit. That's never uh, happened before. Ever. Unheard of on, <laughs> on Nintendo and Super Nintendo that that ever has happened at any third party company ever. No. <laughs> oh, my God. You're telling me Mega Man had the same sprite for six entire games and now it's a problem. Oh, shit. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, I think everyone understands what we're saying. Go play the games, guys. Just go play them. And if you've heard Quest 64 is bad, which I'm sure you have, give it a try. It's probably not as bad as you thought. Um, Mike, thank you for doing this with me. This was great. I love talking not just old games, but old games in this way through, uh, you know, uh, modern lens or the way people view stuff. So thank you for joining me for this. Thank you for having me. There's nothing I like more than telling people that they don't play enough video games and they need to stop reading clickbait articles online. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, if, if, but until that day, um, catch this man on his account on Twitter, Quest64 Official. Catch the show Fine Time on Twitter at Fine Time Podcast. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. We'll see you next time on, on, on Fine Time. <laughs>